We'll get started in about two minutes. Thanks for your patience. Morning. All right, everybody, thanks for joining in. Uh, just a reminder, this session is being recorded and I'll make the recording available in the announcements after we're done. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so you should be seeing the course homepage because somebody kindly unmute and let me know if that's what you're actually seeing. Anybody? Up there. Thank you very much, appreciate it. All right, so uh, just as a reminder, um, you know, the, now the videos from our Prior class uh, sessions is are all available in the announcements. Um, so you know, if for any reason you need to go back and refer to it, um, I will post the today's session um, after I get the video caption. It take me about a day or two, just as a reminder. All right. So um, here we are this week dealing with uh, waves. And uh, you see that we have roughly two weeks before your project is due. So I'm going to take a moment to talk about the project tonight. And then next week, we'll have a, another opportunity to talk about the project and then, and also we'll talk next week. Well, I'll talk this week too about uh, the remaining sessions um, for this class, okay? So, because we're, we're winding down uh, three weeks, this class will be over with basically. All right, so let me talk about the project, okay? And I'll do that to, tonight and I'll talk some more about it next week. But just to remind you, if you look in the announcements, one of the things you have available is a video that I made available to you way back at the beginning of this course that talks about the project. So you can definitely take advantage of watching that video. Um, you know, if you, if you uh, feel like you want to go back and review information dealing with the project. But tonight I'm gonna um, focus on a few things and then next week I'll talk about some more stuff. Just try to make sure that, um, you know, you have an opportunity while we're here all together to ask any questions you might have regarding the project. So um, 
just to remind you, you do have access to picture layouts that guide you as far as how the reference page should be laid out and how your first page should look along with some other tips, all of which I've um, covered, covered in the video. And I mentioned that when I talked about the project the last time as well. So you have access to those picture templates right here in the project information. The rubric that I'll talk about next week is also there. It has been all along. Information on how you submit your project, so on and so forth, okay? And the project details are contain all of the instructions that you need for the project. So between the information in this folder, what I'm going to cover and the video that's in the announcements, uh, you should be able to do more than a, a good job, you know, on, on this project, all right? And ask questions if you have, um, have them while I'm covering this. So let me just move this out the way. So just a kind of quick reminder, um, your summary has to be two pages long, type, double space 12 point font. There's a template for your first sentence. Um, your paper needs to have one inch margins all around. Um, remember, you don't need an abstract since your summary is already an abstract. Uh, you have to put the ID block in the upper left corner, single space, and there I itemize for you the I things that go in the ID block, your name, my name, the class, and section, and the date. Please do not use a running header. I know that that is APA format, but I do not want a running header use an abbreviated header that contains your name and the page number. And you put that in the upper right corner. You should not be using any in-text citations because you do not have multiple sources. The only source for this project is your article, the one that you got, to, got approved. And so you do not have, and you should not be citing or using in your reference page or in the body of your summary anywhere, you should not be citing any additional sources outside of your article. Um, if you quote from your article, that is the time that you have to use a citation. You have to remember to put quotes, quotation marks around the quoted material and your citation consists of the page number in parentheses after you close the quote so that I know the page that you utilized for the material that you quoted directly. Otherwise, you are paraphrasing in your own words and you have given acknowledgement for that in your first sentence. So your first sentence tells me your source. You are writing this in your own words properly paraphrasing, no plagiarism. And if you quote, you put that material in quotation marks and you put inside parentheses, the page number where you got that quoted material after you close the quote. You have the picture templates that I just showed you to help you, um, you know, make sure you lay out your paper correctly. Um, just be mindful that the pictures that I showed you are not to scale. There's no way for me to draw a picture in double spacing, you know, on a board or anything like that. And you do have some resources there dealing with APA format. Just remember to follow my instructions, even if it contradicts APA, meaning no running header no in-text citations, okay? You're gonna follow my guidance 
as you know the the rule um because there are some places where i've asked you to format things in a way that is a little different than what apa says the main things that have to be according to apa are the margins the spacing and your reference page okay are there any questions about that All right, so remember you need to include a reference page and it has to be an APA format. You should not have multiple items listed on your reference page. The only item that should be listed on your reference page is the article that you're summarizing, okay? Do not include Wikipedia, or any of those other sources because they're not valid. You might have consulted them to help you understand the article, but they are not to be cited on your reference page, only your article, okay? And if you don't put in, include a properly formatted reference page, you'll lose five points, okay? Plagiarism, that is a no-no. It will cost you all of the points and you will get a zero on this project, okay? And if you want to refresh yourself on what is considered plagiarism, I have a website bookmark right there that says, in the section that says avoid plagiarism. So you should not be copying verbatim unless you are quoting and you need to put quotation marks on that and put the page number in parentheses, as I explained earlier. If you are paraphrasing, you need to properly paraphrase, meaning in your own words, please do not copy from the article and then change a few words here or there. That is still considered plagiarism. Even if you do not copy something verbatim, if you only change some keywords with synonyms, that is considered plagiarism. If what you are writing follows the format and structure and content and intent of the author, and it is not in your own words, I am going to cite you for plagiarism and give you a zero, okay? Any questions about that? Please include a full copy of the article. That could be a PDF copy of the article. It could be a link to the article. As long as I have access to the full article that you got approved to do this project, then you're fine. If you did not get your article approved, you are still doing the project. You still need to include a full copy of the article. It's just that you're losing 20 points off the top. And remember, if your article is not approved and it doesn't meet the three major um, rules or uh, um, you know, requirements for the article, meaning it's, it's on the right topic, it's long enough, and it is a peer reviewed article, then you'll get a zero. So if you didn't get an article approved, you're already 20 points in a hole. And if you choose something that is not the proper requirement that doesn't meet the standards, you'll get a zero on the project, okay? Um, so, Make sure that, you know, if you got an article approved, you include that article with your submission. You can include the PDF copy of it. You can include a link to it. But if you don't turn in the article that you used, you'll lose five points automatically. And the project is worth 100 points. The scoring rubric I just showed you is available in the project folder. And that is what I'm going to talk about next week. 
don't forget your project is due the 27th of November by 11.59 p.m. What are your questions? My suggestion to you is before you um, begin writing or definitely before you turn in your summary, please come back and consult these instructions, watch the video that I've made available, and then ask any questions that you have before you turn in the project, okay? What questions do you have of me regarding the project? All right. So let's jump into this week's material. All right, this week's topic is waves. So <clears throat> what we're gonna be looking at here is information on what are waves? We'll look at the universal wave equation. We'll look at the different types of waves. We'll look at the parts of a wave. And then we'll talk about um, some major properties that we measure for waves, including wavelength, the frequency, velocity, period. And then we'll look at, um, we'll talk about sound waves in particular, we'll focus on the speed of sound. And then um, we'll look at some sample problems that utilize the wave equation so that you know how to, how to solve problems with this. Okay. All right, so um, I bookmark for you to read chapter 12, uh, excuse me, chapter 11 in the CK12 textbook that deals with waves. And there are some videos that deal with waves. And then of course, the supplemental notes here are my notes that I'm gonna use to um, cover the topic. And then I will take a look at the extra notes folder and we'll look at, um, we'll look at in particular, some examples that use the wave equation and we'll look at the speed of sound, okay? okay. So um, the whole goal here is to look at um, you know, oscillatory motion, and that's what waves are. They fall into the category of oscillatory motion or periodic motion. And so um, we want to know, you know, about the different types of waves, the properties of waves, and then what, what properties do we measure and, and how do we use those to do some calculations? So when you hear the word oscillatory or oscillation, we're talking about back and forth motion. And so on uh, this, mo this, this motion is much like what happens with a child swing as it moves, swings back and forth, as it oscillates back and forth. A pendulum clock is another example of oscillatory motion, okay? So the, the, um, the bob of the clock swings back and forth. Um, and in there, in nature too, we have, uh, you know, have things like atoms and molecules that also oscillate. Now we're gonna, we're not gonna focus on the atoms and molecules because we don't deal with that kind of microscopic uh, motion, if you will. But we will look at, you know, larger scale objects. Okay. Now, when an object is oscillating, it can create a wave. So as, this, uh, as an object swings or moves back and forth, it generates a wave. 
And that wave is a disturbance. It's a disturbance. Uh, more specifically, you can think of a wave as organized energy. It's energy that disturbs its surroundings. So a wave is organized energy in motion such that it disturbs the, the, the its surroundings, the material, the matter around it. And we say, in, be, because of that, we say that it propagates, okay? And so to give you an example, a plucked guitar string oscillates back and forth. So that object, that guitar string is the object, it moves back and forth. And as it does that, it creates a sound wave, which disturbs the air surrounding it, okay? Another example is an earthquake. So during an earthquake, the ground oscillates, sending forth energy that disturbs the, you know, the ground surrounding what we typically say the epicenter of the earthquake, right? And then they tell you here, things without mass can oscillate as well. Light is an example of um, light doesn't have any mass, okay? And so what happens is the electric and magnetic field oscillate, sending forth energy that can actually travel through empty space. Please, when we say light, don't just think of visible light. Light can mean any type of electromagnetic radiation. So as the electric and magnetic field oscillates, it sends forth a wave that can travel through empty space. And that wave is nothing more than organized energy. So we're gonna focus on the simplest type of oscillators. And those, the simplest type of oscillators, a lot of times you'll hear them term simple harmonic oscillators and they exhibit simple harmonic motion. And so the simplest type of oscillation and waves obey Hooke's law. So Hooke's law can be utilized to help us explain and predict the motion of these simple harmonic oscillators, okay? And so you see in the box Hooke's Law, F equals minus KX, where F stands for the restoring force, and I'll explain why we call it a restoring force in just a moment. X is the displacement of the object that is oscillating from its equilibrium position. Sometimes you'll hear that called either the deformation, the displacement, or the stretch in the case of a spring. A K is called the force constant. And this constant helps us to understand how uh, stiff or rigid our oscillator is. Um, and you see the units for this constant K, newtons per meter, newtons force, meters, displacement. So you can think of it as force per displacement. That's why we have units newtons per meter. Now in this formula, you see a minus sign. That is why F is called a restoring force because whichever direction we, the, the oscillator deforms or stretches, this restoring force causes it to move in the opposite direction back to its equilibrium position. 
okay? So we stretch or displace our oscillator from the equilibrium position. And when we let it go, the restoring force moves it back in the opposite direction toward its equilibrium. And that minus sign tells us that this is a restoring force, okay? So one of the properties that we're interested in for our oscillators is the period. In fact, we typically refer to oscillators or oscillatory motion as periodic motion because as the oscillator moves back and forth, it repeats itself at regular time intervals. Okay, and I give the uh, example of a mass on a spring moving up and down. So as you stretch the spring and then let it go and the object that's attached to the spring will, will bounce, you know, will, will move back and forth. And in doing so, it will exhibit periodic motion. A motion that it repeats itself, okay? And so in periodic motion, the time to complete one oscillation is called the period, capital T. Well, this is not a foreign a property to you because when we dealt with um, uniform circular motion, the time it takes for the object to complete one trip around the circle is called the period. So circular motion is an example of periodic motion because the object moving in a circle repeats itself at a regular time interval. Okay, so this back and forth kind of motion is periodic and the time it takes for the oscillator to make one complete uh, cycle is called a period. Another important property for these oscillators is the frequency. And period and frequency are related. As you can see in the box, the formula shows their relationship, they're inverse of each other. But please don't mix them up because they're not the same. The frequency tells us the number of cycles per unit time. In other words, how many times does the oscillator repeat itself per unit time? The unit for frequency is Hertz. And so just like the frequency and period have inverse relationship, so do the units for each of them. So one Hertz is equal to one over one second. Okay, and we'll see a little bit more about this when we solve some sample problems, it'll start to, um, the relationship will be a little bit more clear, hopefully, as we look at some example problems. So simple harmonic motion. So any system that can be described by Hooke's law is called, um, a simple harmonic oscillator and it exhibits simple harmonic motion. If you're dealing with simple harmonic motion or a simple harmonic oscillator, the maximum displacement is called the amplitude. So remember our simple harmonic oscillators move back and forth generating a wave. Well, the wave that represents or that is generated by the oscillator um, also has an amplitude and that amplitude is often referred to as the height of the wave. And that is representative of the maximum displacement that our oscillator undergoes. So to give you an example of a mass attached to a spring, and I'll show you a visual here in just a moment. 
those of you in lab class will appreciate this because this is the experiment that you're gonna be working on this week. So if you take a spring and attach it to a wall and then you attach like um, an object to the other side, as it moves, it oscillates back and forth and the maximum amount that you stretch it is called the amplitude. The formula in the box tells us how we can find the period of our simple harmonic oscillator. So our simple harmonic oscillator has a period equal to two times pi times the square root of M where M is the mass, whatever mass is attached to our, you know, our oscillate, our spring in this case. And then K, if you remember, that is the spring constant or the force constant, okay? So to get the period, you have to take two times pi, which is 3.14, times the square root of M over K. That's how we find the period, the time it takes for our oscillator to make one complete oscillation. The period is found by taking two pi square root M over K, where M is the mass and K is the spring constant or the force constant. And so they're showing you a picture here. So we have an object attached to a spring and notice on the far left, it's not stretched at all. Once we let it go, it stretches and then comes to um, a stop and at its equilibrium position. And then once it's at its equilibrium position, if we stretch it a little bit further or displace it further by an amount X, it will oscillate back and forth between plus X and minus X, okay? Another example of a simple harmonic oscillator is the simple pendulum. Now, please don't stress yourself over what you're seeing in the picture. That is not something that I would expect you to be um, you know, mathematically fluent at dealing with. But what you can find for a simple pendulum is the period, two pi square root L over G. Well, you can see the period for a simple pendulum looks very similar to the period for an object attached to a spring. As I mentioned before, also an object that is in uniform circular motion is also exhibiting simple harmonic motion. And notice as the object moves in a circle, it traces out, oh, sorry, I apologize. It traces out a wave and they show that that wave is periodic. It has a period T, okay? So an object moving in a circle, a pendulum, and an object attached to a spring are all examples of simple harmonic oscillators. They exhibit simple harmonic motion, um, which can be described using Hooke's law. They are all periodic. And you have the formula for finding the period of a object attached to a spring or a pendulum as it's swinging back and forth. A uh, damp harmonic motion is not something that we really get into. This, you just need to understand that when you start talking about damped harmonic motion is no longer simple. And the reason it's damp is because there's friction in the system. Our simple harmonic oscillators are moving in a theoretical fashion without friction. But once we're operating in the real, real world, you know that there is friction. And so our oscillator will be damped. And we don't need to worry about under damping, over damping or critical damping. Just know that it's not gonna behave 
smoothly or periodic. Okay. Um, and so in this particular visual, they're talking about uh, resonance. So resonance is a property of our oscillator. And in this particular situation, there's a periodic force that uh, causes our oscillator to move back and forth or oscillate at its natural frequency, okay? And we'll talk about that resonance here in just a bit, a bit more when we look at uh, the extra notes. Uh, some of this will be a little bit easier to follow when we get into the uh, extra notes. What you have given here is the formula for finding a wave's speed. This is called the universal wave equation. And in this equation, you can see there are some properties listed. We need to make sure we understand them. So from the visual that they've shown here, we can see that the pitch in the picture, we have a wave and that wave is moving forward to the right. You can see the green arrow that shows the wave has a speed moving forward. The height of the wave, the amplitude of the wave represents its maximum displacement. And that is X in this case. The length of the wave, that is the distance from the one peak to the next, next peak. So we say the wavelength is measured from peak to peak. And notice the symbol that they use for the wavelength. It looks like a funny, it looks like an upside down Y, but it's actually a Greek letter. It's lambda, lambda. And so to find the speed of the wave, what you do is you multiply the frequency times the wavelength. Okay, the frequency times the wavelength. Remember the frequency is measured in Hertz and the wavelength is measured in meters in the SI or metric system. So when you multiply frequency times wavelength, you get the wave speed in meters per second. We'll see how that works out in just a moment when we solve some sample problems. What types of waves are there? One type of wave is a transverse wave. And you see in the picture on the left, the transverse wave. Notice that our way, our oscillator in this case is like the slinky and it is moving up and down in the picture on the left. It is moving up and down. Okay, you can see that the arrows that are kind of like going through the hand are telling us that they're shaking the oscillator up and down. The wave is moving to the right. Those arrows pointing to the right tell us the direction of propagation for our wave. So our slinky is the medium in this case. It is oscillating up and down. The wave or the energy that is moving through the slinky is moving to the right. So perpendicular to the disturbance of our medium. The longitudinal wave on the other hand, up moves parallel to the disturbance of our medium. So in the picture on the right, notice the arrows that's close by the hand is showing us that the slinky is moving left and right, okay? So it's oscillating left and right. The wave or the energy that's moving through the slinky is moving to the right, okay? And why is it important that you know the difference? Because light waves are always transverse. And sound waves, which we'll talk about here shortly, are longitudinal. Uh, we won't get into superposition. superposition. Um, 
So as I mentioned earlier, you know, waves are um, organized energy, right? And the amount of energy, the magnitude of the energy is related to the amplitude. And that's easy concept to understand, right? More amplitude, the more energy the wave carries, right? And so um, another property that is related to the energy is the wave's intensity. And in the metric system, that unit for intensity is watts per square meter. Watts per square meter. Okay, we know watts because that's power, right? Power is measured in watts, so you can think of it kind of like that. How much power per square meter? Well, we know also that power is related to energy, right? So watts per square meter tells us intensity. And a lot of times we hear intensity measured using decibels on the decibel scale, okay? But remember, we do things using the metric system. And so intensity is power per unit area. Okay. All right. So that's what I wanted to cover in the supplemental notes. Now I'm going to go into my extra notes folder. Bear with me just for a second. I'll bring that up. And I'll put links to all of this, the extra notes in the um, in the announcements. I always put a link to the extra notes. All right, so here we are on waves. And so one of the things that I covered was the universal wave equation. Let me see if I can blow that up a little bit. Um, let's see, maybe I have to do it that way. All right. Oh, sorry. There we go. So this talks about um, the relationship between period and frequency. So the period is the time it takes to go from one peak to the next. It is measured in seconds. Whereas the frequency is the number of peaks per second and it's measured in hertz. Period and frequency are inverse of each other. So T is equal to one over F. And that means their units are also inverse. So one second is equal to one over one hertz. Or if you write it in terms of the frequency, one hertz is equal to one over one second. And then we can take our knowledge of period and frequency and utilize them along with the wavelength in meters. And then we can get the velocity of our wave. So that script looking kind of V is for the velocity. And to get it, you take the wavelength times the frequency or the wavelength times one over the period. Either of those formats for finding the velocity of our wave will give us units for velocity meters per second, okay? So you have access to that right in the extra notes folder that I'll share with you dealing with waves. The, some examples um, I did work in this folder. Let me just move this out of the way, okay? So here's an example says here, an earthquake produces a wave that has a wavelength of 417 meters and travels at 5,000 meters per second. What is its frequency? So notice I've modeled the wave equation using my problem solving pyramid. In this particular example, they gave me the wavelength lambda as 417 meters. They gave me the uh, speed, 5,000 meters per second. 
and they want me to find the frequency. So the smiley face is covering the frequency symbol F. So I know then that to get the frequency, I must divide the speed by the wavelength because speed is on the top of the pyramid, wavelength is on the bottom. So I'm dividing 5,000 meters per second divided by 417 meters. Well, you can put the numbers in the calculator and that'll give you 12, but how do the units work? So in the numerator, I have meters per second. In the denominator, I have meters. So the meters will cancel and I'll be left with one over seconds. Well, remember, one over second is just equivalent to Hertz, right? So that's how you get the unit Hertz in this case. You have to properly manage the unit. If you tell me 12 and you give me the unit one over seconds, I'm going to mark it wrong because the correct unit in the SI system is the Hertz. Okay. And so I did this for you as a visual to help you with the units. So whether you use the format for the wave equation on the right, speed equals lambda times one over the period, where meters is for lambda and one over seconds, because the period T is measured in seconds. So when you put that together, you get meters per second. If you use the format on the right, excuse me, yeah, on, on the right, you have lambda times frequency. Frequency is measured in meters. I mean, uh, lambda is measured in meters. Frequency is measured in Hertz. Replace one over seconds for Hertz. And again, you get meters per second. So I've broken down in this visual, the units that you utilize when you're dealing with the wave equation. Okay. Um, this packet on waves and sound, uh, the part on human hearing, Doppler effect, and seeing with sound, those are some interesting topics. You can take a look at that. What I'm interested in is the speed of sound because sound is an example of a wave. It is a longitudinal wave. It is a longitudinal wave created when energy moves through a medium many times air, okay? And that's why in this visual, they tell you that the speed of sound is 344 meters per second in air that's at 20 degrees Celsius, okay? Well, what if the air is not at 20 degrees Celsius? What if the air is at a different temperature? Well then your speed of sound depends on the type of medium. Sound travels best through solids, liquids, then gases, okay? And sound cannot travel in empty space or vacuum. Light can travel in empty space or vacuum, but sound has to have a medium. And the speed of sound also depends on the temperature of that medium. It will travel faster when the medium is at a higher temperature, because just think about it, the molecules in the medium will be more energetic if you're dealing with a higher temperature. And then the formula that you see at the bottom, that is how you find the speed of sound depending on temperature T. In this formula, please do not mix up this T with the period T. The T in this formula stands for temperature at using Celsius as your unit, okay? So 331 meters per second is like your baseline. And then you take your temperature and you multiply it times 0.6. And then you add that to 331, okay? So let me show you an example utilizing that formula. Okay. 
Again, you have access to this right in the extra notes folder that I'm gonna make available to you, okay? So I gave you an example here on the right, um, utilizing the red writing. So I said, what if your, the air was at 45 degrees Celsius? So you take 331 meters per second plus 0.6 times 45. You see that your uh, Celsius will cancel. And so 0.6 times 45 gives me 27. And my unit on that is meters per second. And so then I take 331 meters per second and I add it to 27 meters per second. And it tells me the speed of sound will be 358 meters per second. Okay, so I'm showing you an example of how you utilize that formula, okay? Um, the other thing that is covered in this packet deals with resonance. And I mentioned that we will talk about that a little bit more. Harmonics, interference, acoustics, all of those other topics are great to look at, but what I'm interested in is resonance, okay? And so resonance deals with force vibration. So when one vibrating object forces another object to vibrate at the same frequency, okay? And so you're forcing the, the other object to vibrate at the same frequency, and this makes the sound louder because you have more stuff vibrating okay, at the same frequency. And it's useful for tuning instruments like guitars, pianos, et cetera. But resonance can also have a destructive side. And that is when we're dealing with this special case of forced vibration where an object is forced, that word induced, that's what it means, forced. So an object is forced to vibrate at its natural frequency. So that's what happens, for example, when the opera singer hits the note and shatters the glass. What happens there? So the note that the opera singer sings has a certain frequency. And as the energy from that note gets transferred to the glass molecules. It forces the glass molecules to vibrate at their natural frequency. And since glass is a solid, when those molecules start to vibrate at their natural frequency, it shatters the glass. This is also what can happen in the case of like an earthquake. So an earthquake will generate a wave. That wave has energy. It has a frequency. And when that energy gets transferred to the molecules that make up the bridge, it will cause the bridge molecules to oscillate at their natural frequency, thereby damaging or in some cases shattering the bridge. And that's what you see uh, pictured here. It's not an earthquake though. This is like um, kind of like a wind tunnel effect that's happening here. So the, the, the wind has energy associated that gets transferred to the bridge and causing the bridge molecules to vibrate sway at the natural frequency, okay? And thereby damaging the bridge, all right? So that's um, what I wanted to cover in the extra notes, the, the relationship between period and frequency, the wave equation, the speed of sound and resonance. So what questions do you have of me regarding the extra notes information that I've covered here?
You did say it wasn't available right now. You're going to make it available, right? Correct. I always put a link to the extra notes when I post the video. So if you go back and look at any of the announcements where I posted the video, there, there are links to the extra notes folder that I use for the night um, so that you have direct access to it. What are your questions for me? Please don't hesitate to ask. All right, so I'm going to stop the share at this point. Uh, if you're working on any of the items that you need to get completed for the week, that is the WAVES discussion or problem set number 11, or if you're working on your project and you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to address any questions that you have. All right. So if you don't have any questions for me, we're done for tonight. Um, I'll see you back here next Monday. We'll talk about the project again, and then we'll talk about what's next on your plate uh, for the remainder of the semester. Um, whoever is Zoom user, Tyler, Danielle, uh, we're done. Did you have questions for me, Tyler, Danielle, or Zoom user? I'm not sure who Zoom use, user is. No, I don't have any questions, but I did want to congratulate you on making history. Huh? I want to congratulate you on making history. I saw the article on RPCC's oh, page. Yeah, yeah. Well, I surely do appreciate that. Zoom user, do you have any questions for me? Tyler, do you have any questions for me? Hello? All right, I'm going to stop the recording.